Two years ago, I made a video about ancient Greek drinking games. I assembled a band of intrepid volunteers, wrapped myself in a bedsheet, and spent an afternoon draining a box of wine. Not all the games we played were strictly classical. No ancient text, for example, mentions slapping the wineskin. I was also unable to confirm that the Greeks played Flippy Goblet. When we finally got around to playing actual ancient drinking games, the results were mixed. I decided to reuse the original footage in a new video for your delight and edification. Before we watch that new and improved version, a brief disclaimer. I am not encouraging anyone to imitate my symposium and do not endorse irresponsible behavior. In drinking, as in all things, the Greek ideal was self-control. With that firmly in mind, let's get started. This video focuses on the Greeks, because the Romans, to put it in academic terms, kinda sucked at drinking games. They knew how to party, of course, but for all the infamous debauchery of their banquets, the Romans preferred watching entertainers or gambling to organize drinking games. When the Romans did play drinking games, they were lame. We hear, for example, about parties at which everyone had to drink as many cups of wine as the number of letters in the host's name. That would get you drunk, all right, but it's not a whole lot of fun to play. The Greeks got much more creative at their symposia. The word symposium literally means drinking together, and that's just what a symposium was, an opportunity for a small group of men to socialize, talk a little politics or philosophy, deli with flute girls, and get tipsy. The symposium began with a meal. Then the tables were taken away, everyone put on their garlands, and a large mixing bowl was set in the center of the room. After that, the drinking, and drinking games, began. When I decided to stage my own symposium, from, of course, the purest of academic motives, I encountered a series of unexpected problems. The first issue was setting. Greek symposia were always held inside. The guests lounged on couches along the walls, propped themselves up on their left elbow, and faced the center of the room. Unfortunately, I did not have access to any dining couches or large rooms. But I did have access to a backyard, some sleeping bags, and a few half-deflated pool floats. The centerpiece of every symposium was the crotter, or mixing bowl, from which the wine was served. Although there were several types of cups, the most common was the kylix, a wide and shallow goblet with two big handles. For my symposium, the largest pot in my kitchen became the crotter. And after several attempts to Frankenstein a kylix out of two coffee mugs, I gave up and bought vaguely ancient-looking cups from local thrift stores. Finally, I found some people who were willing to work for box wine and pizza. Then it was showtime. Every symposium had a symposiarch, a master of ceremonies, who decided how much water would be mixed into the communal wine. Having appointed myself symposiarch, I decided on a two-thirds water mix with the very best box wine that $11 could buy. Then we drank the first round. At a symposium, it was usual to drain one's cup at a single pull. And this we did to our immediate and collective regret. That feeling was reinforced when we proceeded to the oldest of all drinking games, straight-up competitive drinking. In the typical Greek version, two or more contestants would face off and drain progressively larger cups. The only rule was that each cup had to be finished at a single go. We then moved on to Kotobos, the Greek equivalent of beer pong. The goal of the game was to hit a small target with droplets of wine or dregs flung from one's cup. The best-known version of Kotobos was played with a tall stand topped by a figurine holding a small bronze disc. This stand would be set up in the middle of the room, and party guests would take turns whipping wine at it from their couches. To throw, a guest would twist his index finger around the handle of the cup 
and then whirl it with a motion of his forearm. The wine droplets from a successful throw would knock the dish from its perch and send it clattering onto a metal platform built into the stand. Kotobos, we discovered, is much harder than beer pong. It was difficult for the Greeks, too. Skillet Kotobos was admired and considered a sign of future success. But we were exceptionally bad, partly because we were using a Campbell's soup mug and a candy dish instead of an actual Kylix, and partly because none of us was feeling especially coordinated. There was another, much easier version of Kotobos, which involved aiming wine droplets at small cups floating in a tub of water. Frankly, we should have played that version. But by the time I realized this, we were fully and hopelessly committed to hitting the target on the stand, which we never quite managed to do. Eventually, we resorted to desperate measures. There were other Greek drinking games, but since we didn't attempt these, I'll refer you to my book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants, for a full discussion. In the coming weeks, I have a whole series of interesting videos planned. Until then, as always, thanks for watching, and stay thirsty, my friends, for knowledge. Before we watch that new and improved version, a brief disclaimer. I am not encouraging anyone to...